Hi, I'm John Miller from John Miller Design in Yelling Up Western Australia. Uh, we're near um, Margaret River, we're in the Margaret River region of southwestern Australia, renowned for its very spectacular surf, very excellent quality wine, and a vibrant local artistic community. Uh, John Miller Design is a small boutique jewellery manufacturing business and we employ about 12 people. About five of them are jewellers at the bench working. We use old world techniques and specialising in uh, forging, fusing, hammering and making our own steel punches, uh, which, um, of which I now have probably the largest collection in the world which feature Australian flora and fauna for the most part. Today, I'm going to be showing you how to make a forged silver bracelet. And this is a sort of how to do a quickie on it. Uh, I've cut this piece off, a larger piece of six millimeter round silver wire. And uh, that's about uh, not quite a quarter of an inch. And um, I'm going to try and uh, show you how to get through this nice and quick with a big hammer on a polished steel block. I've polished my steel block, I've given my hammer a bit of a dress so it's not too grungy and away we go. As we go, the metal starts to spread. A long time ago when I first started doing this, which was 47 years ago, a jeweler told me not to be afraid of the metal and just give it a good old go. So we've got a spread on one end now. I'm going to hold that nice and flat the other way and do the same thing on the other end. Pretty good. Okay, I've got my ends to make it out into a little bit propeller shaped. It's got a bit of a twist in it, but we'll sort that out. And now I'm going to go into the middle. Now, the more we hammer in one spot, the wider it will get there, and also the narrower it will become in cross section. Um, and it's going to go a bit silly. There's a few rules we have to follow here. I might come around with a slightly rounded profile hammer. The rule is always be working it back to straight. Rule number one, always be working it back to straight. And what happens is if we beat on one side, it will bend around that way. So and then we beat on the other side, it will straighten it up again. So always be hammering on the inside of your curve if you've got a curve. You can see it's going a bit banana shaped this way. Uh, and I want to go and take it a little bit that way. But if I hammer on the inside of that curve, it will straighten it out again. That's about as far as I want to go with the big hammer at this stage. So I'll change hammers and I'll be right back. Okay, I'm, I'm pulling down my profile because I haven't got much curve on here and it's starting to bite in at the edges. So I've got myself a nice polished hammer here with a reasonable round sort of profile on it, good sort of radius. And the rule is really to always, I'm working on a nice clean steel block and I'm working with a nice polished hammer. It's a fairly standard ball peen, common or garden ball peen hammer, but I've put a nice polish on it uh, and a final polish with a product called Steel Bright, which is tin oxide. 
and that gives you a really nice shiny hammer. It's good to dress it up occasionally as you go because it gets a bit pitted. And uh, this will give us, in effect, a, a really nice finish. So you don't really have to buff it or polish it later. Uh, and now I'm just going to keep going. Unfortunately, even the best quality steel will, while you're doing this, will get little pits in it from the hammering and um, it wouldn't matter too much except once there's a dozen little pits in it and you keep hammering, it's a dozen plus a dozen plus a dozen and you end up with um, thousands of dirty little marks in there. So I'm going to go and polish my hammer again and give it a bit of a final, final uh, whack on this steel block before I take it over to a mandrel. Okay, now I, you can see where I've hammered more in the middle, it gets wider. Uh, it's got really quite a nice sort of shiny beaten finish on it uh, with a little bit of ball peen effect. And um, we could make that more exaggerated by using a sharper peen or we can use a cross peen or any kind of, any kind of uh, hammer effect we want to put on there. Uh, but um, it's looking pretty good. It's, um, I've hammered it out more on the end, so it's a bit wider. I've hammered it more in the middle, so it's a bit wider there. And as you can see, it gets thinner. I've left a little bit of thickness there just so it's got some nice shoulders. And now I'm gonna take it over to the mandrel and round it up. Okay, here's some uh, steel um, mandrels that I've had made for me at the local machine service. And this is high carbon steel. It's not too expensive uh, and mild steel tends to be a bit dirty and grey and lifts off onto what you're working on. So I don't use those ones anymore. I like my high carbon steel mandrels. They don't need to be tempered because otherwise you damage your hammers on them. So they're still soft essentially. And I've had these angle iron brackets put on them so that you can set them up in the fires. And uh, most of the commercial ones you buy, you can't set up in a vise, you've got to hold it in your hand and it makes life really difficult. So we can set this up beautifully like that for us, it makes a sensational anvil for working on. And now I'm just going to belt this thing around. Uh, this is a dead blow hammer which is good because it doesn't bounce. Working with pretty thick metal like this, it can actually jar your handle while you're whacking it on there. So if that's a problem, you can just hold it in a rag and then it doesn't hurt you so much. If you're having trouble bending it, you can always get yourself a wooden V block like this and set it up in there and just whack it down in there to get a good sort of curve in it. Makes life easier and you don't hurt yourself so much. Now I'll get it back onto the mandrel and we'll continue as before. I'm always keeping it clean by the way as I'm working. As I bend this around, it starts to stretch on the outside and it gets a bit matte, goes to a sort of satin finish with little stretch marks and nobody likes stretch marks. And uh, so I want to get this hammer back onto it. Also, it's, it's really quite small. Uh, it looked big, but it isn't. Uh, and that's because although it was about 145 millimeters, uh, we, you have to factor the thickness of the metal into the size. That's really important. 
So it's, um, you've got to add uh, pi times the thickness of the metal to the length of it when you measure it. So it is actually quite small. Uh, so I'm going to give it one more beat, which will give it a really nice finish and get it out to a nice finished product, hopefully. And I need to find the right place to work it on the mandrel. So where I want a tight curve, I'm down. Where I want a broader curve, I'm up. There is a tendency to start thinking about last night's Netflix show or daydream while you're doing this and you really do have to concentrate and stay with it. It doesn't take too long. It will tend to drift and get a bit twisted and you need to always be straightening it back up again by hammering on the inside of the curve. So if this is coming over this way, I'm going to hammer on that side and it'll push it back that way. There's no end to what you can do with a hammer and a piece of gold or silver or copper. Here's a few that I've made. That's nearly finished. That's a, a triscal. That's three, three faces with a cross pin hammer. That started out like that and got up to about there. They will get bigger as you work them. That's another one that's chasing itself around. That beaten finish is your finish. You really only need to give it a quick rouge after that if your hammer's, if your hammer's nice and polished and you'll come up with a great product.